Well, welcome to this edition, the weekend edition of The Writ Race. I'm Dave Trafford, and uh, we are here every day throughout the election campaign, uh, right up until Election Day. And, of course, we'll have something to say on Election Night once we get a sense of who will form the next government here in Canada. Uh, The first week is in the books, and if we're looking at horse race numbers, hard to say right now, as uh, our friend John Wright will always tell you that uh, it's early so and campaigns matter but if we learn nothing else the first week of the campaign it would appear mattered because we are looking at polling now from nanos and from ecos that's showing a tightening race atop the uh, leaderboard right now we're looking at the liberals probably leading in nanos by a couple of points and we have ecos showing the conservatives up by a point All of that within the margin of error, all of that suggesting a dead heat, all of that suggesting a sprint over the next four weeks for this campaign. But there are things that we'll watch for, and we'll wait to see whether or not any of the adjustments that are coming in the uh, coming days, based on the way the agendas and the uh, campaigns are going to go, are reflected in what we saw in week one. Week one, typically, you know, where we had... Uh, the Prime Minister coming out without any real ballot question, but it would seem, based on the numbers from the polls again, that uh, Aaron O'Toole for the Conservatives and Jagmeet Singh at the NDP both were able to take advantage of that. So I spent some time talking about that and a couple of other items around the discourse uh, that is going on during campaigns. During the radio show on News Talk 1010, I host the show from 6 to 9 o'clock in the morning. And uh, yeah, you're happy to join me on Saturday and Sunday. On Saturday morning, spend some time talking to John Cameron. He's an associate professor at the Department of International Development Studies at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. Now, I know you think we're going to talk about the Nova Scotia election. No, we'll get to that. But Professor Cameron talks to us about a piece that he wrote in the past week about nonprofit groups and charities that are on the front lines of some of the biggest issues facing Canadians right now. might be homelessness, it might be hunger, might be poverty, uh, could well be, you know, the the way we treat First Nations, etc. All of these things you think are top of mind, should be in a campaign. They have frontline first experience on this stuff. Oddly enough, Professor Cameron points out Their voices are rarely heard during a campaign. And what it comes down to is some cash, but really restrictions around who can and who shouldn't be speaking during a campaign. Elections Canada has rules on what they call third party or political advertising by third parties. Uh, And that sounds a bit complicated. It just means... Uh, any organizations or individuals that want to spend money, more than $500, to boost uh, their, you know, whatever it is they want to say about public policy during the election. They have to register with Elections Canada, and then they have to report on that spending. Uh, The registration requirements are not onerous. They're not particularly complicated. Uh, For really small organizations, they might be more than they could handle. But for any organization that has, you know, more than a couple of paid staff members, they could probably manage these these regulations. Uh, The challenge, uh, I think, comes where, you know, so part of of it is organizations just wanting to avoid any extra bureaucracy because it it weighs them down, it distracts them from uh, the other work that they're doing. Um, But there's also a long history in Canada of the federal government in particular, of all political stripes, uh, I'll say suppressing in some cases, in other cases discouraging public policy engagement by nonprofits and charities. And so groups uh, now in 2021 are looking at the current regulations, but they're seeing those regulations in the context of a long history of uh, governments and government agencies that have made things difficult for them uh, when they have engaged in public policy work. Well, yeah, and I, I on the, on the surface of that, it sounds as if, you know, something nefarious is going on. On the other side of that is, you know, you can argue that what they're trying to do is to protect from, you know, um, I guess, a certain amount of cash being injected into a cause that, you know, 
I guess, puts a thumb on the scale, if you will, and almost becomes, you know, that that tyranny of the minority, if you will, when you start to look at the voices that we're hearing and unduly, uh, you know, influences what might be going on out there. So there should be some level of balance and yeah, some exactly. regulation around that, right? Yeah. So when we compare Canada, the situation in Canada to the United States in particular, um, we've got uh, a Supreme Court decision in the United States in 2010 that uh, uh, this is the so-called Citizens United decision that declared any restrictions on um, you know, voicing uh, your opinion on public policies uh, to be unconstitutional. So they now have unlimited uh, capacity for uh, groups to spend money to promote their uh, opinions and ideas uh, at any time of year, but especially during uh, election campaigns. So in the 2016 uh, U.S. Uh, federal election, um, the so-called super PACs uh, spent uh, $1.4 billion uh, on third-party election advertising. In 2020, it was $2.7 billion. It's a huge amount of money mostly contributed by wealthy individuals. So you've got a small number of people um, spending a lot of money uh, to put their uh, their perspectives uh, and opinions out during the election uh, campaign. By contrast, in so, Canada in 2019, the total spending was just over a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. So, but I mean, given that, is it your sense, even with some of these restrictions in Canada, that the discourse during the campaign is st- stalled or somehow, uh, you know, we're disadvantaged in getting a full range of the discussion there, or can we kind of work through this? Yeah, I mean, I would say definitely. There are organizations that uh, are more engaged in public policy debates, uh, in engaging the public, in trying to engage politicians, um, you know, throughout uh, the year, uh, over the years, and then they go relatively silent during election campaigns. Or, you know, put a little bit differently, we can think of the election campaign as kind of a prime opportunity to engage Canadians. We're typically more attentive to public policy debates. You know, during this narrow window, it's 36 days of an election campaign. That's a key time for any organization that's got something to say to, to reach out to Canadians, get us to think about it. Um, if they go silent, they're they're missing an opportunity. And the law does not require those organizations to go silent. It simply says if you're going to spend money to boost your your perspectives uh, or to engage Canadians, you've got to register and you've got to report. Um, but again, it's the threshold for reporting and registering is five hundred dollars. So if you spend five hundred dollars to uh, promote your social media feed, um, then you have to register. So if you're not doing that, you're failing to take an advantage of, uh, of a key opportunity to engage Canadians. John Cameron, listen, thanks for this. It's an interesting perspective on the, the discourse during the campaign. John Cameron is the Associate Professor of the Department of International Development Studies at Dalhousie University. All right. Well, we do get to a conversation about specifically, we were talking about the Nova Scotia election a little earlier uh, this week. Uh, Aaron Trafford, my daughter, lives in Halifax. And Keith Leslie, he's a regular on On the Ledge, also stationed in Nova Scotia these days. So we had a rather robust discussion in the Friday edition of the Rit Race. You might want to go back and have a listen in terms of how provincial politics is rearing its head on the campaign trail. It just so happened that Nova Scotians went to the polls on the 17th of August, only a few days after Trudeau had uh, called the election federally. As you know by now, the incumbent uh, Liberals lost that election. And in fact, the Conservatives won a majority. Now, in some cases, that would have been a bit of a surprise. Uh, in other cases, not so much if you were watching it closely. But Tim Houston will form the next government in Nova Scotia. And uh, Tony Chapman, uh, Tony Chapman Reactions, he's also the host and producer of Chatter That Matters. He and I got into a conversation about that and the, and the nature of politics and what he saw in that particular election of Tim Houston. I've chatted with Tim a couple of times leading into that campaign. You should bring him on to your podcast. He is uh, he is extraordinary. 
Uh, and he, you know, people consider it an upset, but the people that were working in the trenches down there, good people like the Glenn Rankins of the world, they just totally believe that this is the future of politics is somebody that actually stops with the re- rhetoric and actually starts, you know, moving, moving the right policies forward. And, uh, I hope that, I hope that that's a signal for change to happen in Canada, whether you bring in liberals, NDP or conservatives, bring in, uh, purpose, bring in actual effort, bring in for the people versus for the party. And I think it could be, uh, another, uh, ringing of the bell for Canada. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, we got in this discussion and, and uh, you, you probably won't be surprised to hear that all of the political parties uh, and those at the municipal level even have approached Aaron to run for office. Uh, and in each she said in each one of the conversations, it's never about what Aaron can bring to the table. It's about the conversation is you can win. And that's where it stops and starts, period. And that's sadly, Tony, the level of political discourse, winning and losing. It's not to your point about what does it mean in terms of long term, um, you know, view of what we are as a country. How are we going to manage this huge debt we've all, all of a sudden got? It's only winning or losing. Well, let's we'll look at what we're seeing. Why are we having an election right now? Uh, you know, why why are we not uh, absolutely marching on the streets, demanding the people that helped our soldiers in Afghanistan uh, be brought home? Like we, we're just we're so focused on this, as you said, winning versus losing. Aaron, by the way, would be an incredible uh, of incredible value to this country going forward because she's so brilliant. She understands. She's got empathy and humanity. But, you know, as you said, even if she wins, they don't really care what she has to say. I got a, uh, one of the parties asked me to run here and they know it's a riding at the beaches that the conservatives would never win. And I said, I have no interest. We need young, energetic people that have that that have a burning passion to make Canada better versus what it seems right now, which is just a feast, a partisan feast uh, on the backs of taxpayers. And that's a sad state of politics. So I hope that over the over time, people like Aaron will go in and say, yeah, I'll run. But it's not about winning or losing. It's about making a difference to our country and might get back to when politicians were among the most respected professions versus, uh, you know, as you cover in your podcast so often. Uh, a profession we no longer trust. We we use the word corrupt. We use the word uh, self-serving. We you know words that that used to be you know people that are selling encyclopedias door to door are now in the, the people that are leading our economy. Well, you know, and it's funny you, you start to talk about that, and, and there's this blur then all of a sudden in the offering that they have, and it, our attitude, to your point, has become so kind of, uh, I guess, dismayed in terms of what our choices are. I heard people this week, Tony, say, I just wanted to park my vote. I don't even have a place to do that anymore. Yeah, I mean, you know, and that's the sad state, and and. You know, nobody's in the middle anymore. There's no middle ground. I mean, Paul Martin as a liberal was in the middle. Mulroney was in the middle. You could argue Harper and many of his policies were in the middle. You know, the, the liberals have leapfrogged the NDP left. Uh, and, you know, Aaron O'Toole cannot drag so many of his party that seems to be caught in the dark ages with them. And, uh, you know, something has to change. Sadly, I think it's going to be a fiscal wall that we hit as a country. That'll force that change. But I, I just uh, I feel for this next generation coming up. They're going to be living in a lifetime of servitude to our debt. And I would t- I'd argue, David, that, yes, serve was important. Yes, keeping small business was important. But I would argue there's billions and billions and billions of dollars that we invested that we have no idea where it is and we have no idea why it mattered. Uh, other than uh, if you support us uh, as a party, we'll support you. And I think that's just not the right way to be running our country. But again, it's going to be the next generation that's going to have to uh, start waking up and realizing votes do matter. And as you said, we talked about Nova Scotia, maybe long term vision is a lot more important than uh, clever little sound bites at the podium. Always good to have your perspective. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Dave. Have a great uh, last 15 minutes of the show. Enjoy. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Chapman at Tony Chapman Reactions and, of course, the uh, host and producer of Chatter That Matters. You really do have to make an appointment on uh, on Fridays to check out Tony's show. It's an hour, and he, and his, he you know, John Wright points out when, when he positions the show, it's about these inspired stories. And if you don't get it on the air, you can always find it where you find the uh, podcasts. And there are 
is a whole backlog catalog of great stories being told on that podcast. So check it out. Chatter that matters. And just to wrap things up in this episode, I think we'll probably do this on a weekly basis because it's important to look at how this is playing out. Everybody watching the numbers, and that's one thing, the pollsters will do that and we'll leave it to them. But it will be more interesting to me to see how the message changes on the campaign trail, even the words that they choose. John Wright noting this morning on social media that the liberals are finally starting to use the word affordability. Why? Because affordability is showing up in polling across the country, and that's a priority for most Canadians. So we'll watch to see how the messaging works, how the communications apparatus works. For that, well, I bring in my old friend, Bob Pickard. He is the principal at uh, Signal Leadership Communications, and Bob has always got a really good handle on how this has played out. So he begins by grading Justin Trudeau's performance in week one. I don't think it was a good week for Mr. Trudeau because he failed to do the one single thing that he needed to do, I think, and that is to give a convincing rationale for calling the election. He was also, and this surprised me, given his uh, longtime performance excellence. You know, he's always rehearsed. He's always perfect in the way he tries to deliver things. He made mistakes this week. You know, he talked about, you know, you'll forgive me if I don't think about monetary policy. Uh, he uh, mentioned the she session, which created a lot of eye rolling because it was such obvious pandering. And I, this poll number stuck out, Dave. I saw that 44% of Canadians think the prime minister will say anything to get elected. So I, I think there's a certain percentage of people out there who, regardless of what the liberal messaging is, have just tuned out Mr. Trudeau because he seemed to be always trying to to market to them, to sell to them. Well, like, let's, oh, we'll get back to that for a second. So then compare that to what, say, Jagmeet Singh and, and Mr. O'Toole are doing. To me, sure. I thought that, that they were on point vis-a-vis their message and against the backdrop of issues that seem to be resonating with Canadians. Absolutely. I mean, only 8% of Canadians think the uh, think that uh, Mr. Singh will say anything to get elected. So basically, that means that Mr. Singh can say anything to get elected. And he's certainly known to be a charismatic and dynamic salesperson for his point of view. I mean, this guy has presence. He's got this energetic force of personality. He speaks the language of millennials and younger. But there are those who would say that He's also a showboat and a grandstander at every opportunity. And there's certainly a calculation to how cool he is with the young people. You know, he may be the king of TikTok, but he has a long way to go to convince Canadians that he's a prospective prime minister. Yeah, and I think that, you know, Tony Chapman was just on with us uh, in the last uh, bit here, and we were talking about that very thing. And, and you know, you, you, you get into some of the challenges then that O'Toole has in terms of his messaging. Some of it is internal because he's saying one thing, but there are parts of his party that clearly do not align with his own message. Never mind what Canadians think. Yes, quite so, Dave. He is running as a progressive conservative. He's not running as a Reform Party guy like Harper or Scheer did. And so that's going to cause a little bit of backlash on the right wing of his party. So he's working on some kind of a balancing act. And on the right, Bernier's there. Bernier is also having a good campaign so far. I think he's up to 1% to to 4%. That's the range for him. And if he continues to perform strongly on the right, on the so-called freedom or libertarian issues on vaccination, for example, then that represents a challenge for Mr. O'Toole. However, I think O'Toole's done a good job during week one. His team has responded quickly to the issue environment. They've deprived Mr. Trudeau of any wedge issues or hot buttons that he can use against them. O'Toole was in Quebec this week and he was distancing himself proactively from the Andrew Scheer image. He declared himself a, a moderate centrist, pro-choice, uh, you know, in favor of the interests of a modern nationalist Quebec. So, uh, you know, I, I think the thing about O'Toole that's interesting, Dave, is that people still don't know him. He has high negatives, but he's not a he's not a guy who, when you watch him or listen to him, 
you're going to dislike actively. And I think as more people mm. get to know O'Toole, they're not going to see the uh, usual conservative caricature of somebody with some kind of hidden agenda, which is what the liberals usually try to pin on the Tory leader. Well, I want to bring that up with you. If you don't mind, I'm going to bug you every week just to get your sense of this, because I think it's important to track this as we go. So maybe we'll pick up on the the hidden agenda uh, issues uh, when next we speak. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Dave. Have a good one. All right. That'll do it for us on this uh, weekend edition of The Writ Race. And if you uh, like what you hear, we would encourage you to subscribe, share, leave us a comment. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, follow me on Twitter at Dave Trafford, uh, on Instagram at Dave Trafford, and you can also find me on Facebook. So it's pretty easy uh, to get, and we'd love to have the comments. Let us know what you think, and uh, we'd be happy to entertain them and acknowledge the uh, comments, the feedback that we get on the Rit Race. I'm Dave Trafford. This is an Eye Contact Podcast.